So thank you so much for coming to our event, everybody. Uh, my name is Esther Mogada and I run Creating a Space, but I'm also the co-founder of Dig Deep, um, along with Christine, who runs Blackshard Studios, Belfast Design Week, and other collaborative projects. So our event today is a DIY guide on creating a brand, which will be facil facilitated by um, Karishma. So this is our first time hosting a women folk event um, and it's very exciting because we can all find it come together and it's very new territory for all of us as well so bear with us as we're trying to navigate this platform and trying to you know do things digitally because we're very much the type of people to be in person so again we're so happy that you guys are here. So this event is part of our Dig Deep program which is women folks new creative online uh, creative business uh, program that will be running for nine months. And so the aim of this content is to, uh, content workshops and events is to help people start in, um, creating businesses and to, you know, build a business sustainably. And so our three pillars are business, creativity and self-care. So this project is funded by the Ulster Bank and we want to thank them for uh, being able to fund this programme so that we can be here tonight. And without further ado, we introduce Krishma. Thanks so much, Esther, and um, thank you, Christine, as well, for having me today. I'm really delighted to be here, and thank you, everyone, for giving up some of your evening to listen to me. Hopefully, what I'm saying is useful in some sort of way, and hopefully you take something away from this as well. Um, so, as Esther mentioned, this is a DIY guide on creative brand, and I am Krishma. So hello, my um, Twitter handle and all other handles really are at Karishma's World and very conveniently my email address is hello at Karishma's World. Um, so you can get in touch with me that way at any point um, beyond this event as well if you want. So my background is I'm a multidisciplinary designer, I'm a creative entrepreneur, I'm a design facilitator, I'm a podcaster and a micro business owner as well. And Christina Nestor invited me to do this because I brought something slightly different to the world of branding because I'm not a branding expert, but I've worked with a lot of brands and I've also worked developing my own brands and with products and small business as well. So hopefully I'm bringing something slightly different and I know some of you are in branding as well. So hopefully you'll hear something from a slightly different perspective today as well. So just to get you started, I just want to show a couple of branding related projects I've worked on in the recent past. So this was one with the Craft Tea Cat and this was with Merchant and this was for a single limited edition product and it was a sparkling tea. So this involved lots of ideation and then coming up with a lovely brand to do with um, something more opulent as well for the merchant. Then this was a project I did with Turf and Grain magazine, um, and this was a little zine that they wanted to create. So this was a collaborative project and it was also branded and it used lots of their archive material as well, because they've been going for a few years at that point, um, looking at all their photographs and seeing how we could create something that related to their branding, but was slightly different as well. And then this was um, a brand that was created from scratch. And this was the Pop-Up Design Museum, which we started in 2019, starting off when things were safe and we were able to meet in person, if you remember all the way back to then, um, and creating things like maps, creating the full branding from logo to everything else, to the content and beyond as well. And this was it more recently on billboards, but also on websites and also in immersive content as well. So you can see the branding can stretch across lots of different mediums as well. But in this workshop, it's all about your brand and your business. So uh, enough about me. Um, what we'll be covering is what makes a brand, looking at some examples, looking at um, DIY brand guidelines throughout. So just to give you some feedback um, as we're going along and just to see what you think as well how you could bring some of this into your own work um, looking at some resources and then as Esther mentioned as well we'll have some time for Q&A at the end as well so hopefully this will be really hands-on and useful for you as well. So just to start off whenever people think of brands they often think of this sort of thing. They're thinking of perhaps the logo or the name of the brand and some of these are quite famous as well. And branding does involve logos and it does involve names and icons and imagery but it's also much more than that. So I love this quote from Seth Godin who's an entrepreneur 
And I love the way he says that brands also involve expectations, memories, stories, and relationships as well. And you can see there's no mention of logo, mark making, or imagery at this point, but that's also part of branding as well. So I just love this quote by Seth Godin. What your brand is all really about is connecting you to your customer and user. Yeah, the main point of the brand is actually just to connect you to your end user. It's as simple as that. But a good brand makes your customer loyal to you. It makes your customer invested in your company and brings them back really for some more as well and creates a genuine bond with them. And in the practical aspect of what a brand is as well, it comprises of quite a few different components. And these are not all of them, even though this is quite a lot already. Um, but just to go over some of them, it involves the logo, and that is the type and mark. It involves fonts and typography, language and tone, visual elements such as photography and illustration, animation, video, etc. It involves color and how you can use that well. It involves channels such as digital, physical, immersive, social media. But the most important thing within all of this is brand values, because really once you have your brand values, the rest of the things come quite easily as well. So just to kick off then with brand values, what are they? So brand values give your brand purpose. And whenever you're looking at what your brand values are, it's important to ask yourself a lot of questions. So some of the questions might be things like, what is your goal or mission? And you often hear about brands talking about their mission statement or, you know, a sort of sentence that sums them up. And that's what this is all about, trying to get to the core of what you're trying to do. It's important to look at who your audience is or who is your key demographic. And then are you working directly with businesses? Is it business to business or is it business to customer as well? So that can be quite important when you're thinking of what your brand values might be. And also a lot of you might be working within Northern Ireland itself, but perhaps it's a brand that you want to build out globally as well. So are you locally focused or are you globally focused as well? So what I thought we could do is maybe first of all, spend a couple of minutes just creating a word bank. Um, and there'll be lots of little exercises like this throughout just to get you thinking about what your brand might potentially look like or feel like or do. So what a word bank is, is literally just coming up with lots of words that describe your bank or sorry, your brand, can't even talk anymore. Um, and it's things like locally sourced, integrity, humor, diversity, innovative, things that describe what your brand is. And your brand might be yourself. So for example, if you're an artist, it might be that you are your brand potentially as well. So if we spend a couple of minutes just writing down some of um, the words that describe you, and then I'll maybe ask a few people just to let us know what they've got there as well. So if you want to start now, and Esther and Christine, you can also take part if you want to. So if you aim for something like five to 10 words, that's perfect. You can have more or less if you want as well, but that gives you a good idea of what your brand values and words might be. And these words can be useful as well then whenever you're coming up with a mission statement or you're coming up with a business plan to describe your business as well. So they're always useful to refer back to as well. You'll see some of these words come up for a lot of brands. A lot of brands like to say that they're innovative, but it's finding things that are really true to you as well. So it's finding things that are authentic and make you um, what you're trying to achieve with your brand. If people want to share maybe in the chat, I think that might be the easiest way to do it. If you want to share some of the words you've come up with, you know, even a couple. Um, and I can't actually see the chat here. So Esther, if you don't mind um, reading out any that have come up or even sharing the ones you've come up with as well. Yeah, I can share mine. Uh, do you want me to type it or just say it? Oh, just say it, please. Uh, yeah. So my brand values are integrity, creative, diverse, um, like telling stories that have diverse perspectives, reliability, quality, connection, and honest. And then some of the people here in the chat, unique, authentic, honest, trusted, local, sustainable, eco-friendly, seasonal, organic, ethical, locally made, handcrafted, certified, sustainable, creativity and collaboration, personal, fun, environmentally conscious, sustainability, 
doodly, fun, tactile, humorous, colorful, sustainable, diverse, socially responsible. Ooh, I like that one. Uh, that was good to there. <laughs> yeah. uh, innovative, eco-friendly, honest, professional, stress-free, identity, originality, relatability, inclusive, personal. Amazing. And I like stress-free, actually. I'd love that as part of mine, too. Yeah. Um, thanks very much, Esther. So um, hopefully that's been useful for you to just take on and perhaps use later on whenever you come, come to making your brand guidelines as well. Um, as well as your brand values, though, branding is also the art of differentiation. It's what makes you different to other people doing similar things in the marketplace. And that's incredibly important as well when it comes to creating a brand. So the next point is, what is your unique selling point? And you've probably done this before if you've already got a business going, but it's just something to consider. What makes you stand out in a crowd? And again, we'll maybe take just a couple of minutes to think about that as well. So it's just maybe having a note um, and just thinking about what it is that makes you original, that makes you different to somebody doing the same thing as you as well. Because if you imagine if you go into a shop and there's two identical things like two bottles of water what makes you pick one over the other what makes it different and actually sometimes a unique selling point can be quite difficult especially if you're doing something that a lot of other people are doing and you see them doing something that's like you say illustration for example and it's not necessarily about coming up with something from scratch but maybe you're doing things using a particular technique Maybe you're trying to reach a particular audience. So just finding that niche or unique selling point that makes you different. So the whole point of all these exercises as well is just so that at the end you have a bunch of notes that you can then take with you and turn into some brand guidelines as well. And I know some of you will have created brand guidelines for other brands, but then it's quite different whenever you're doing it for yourself as well. So hopefully this will be a nice DIY guide that you can take away with you as well. And again, does anyone want to share in the chat? And Esther, if you don't mind reading out, just sorry, because I can't actually <laughs> see the chat here. So um, if anyone wants to share what their unique selling points are, and Esther, if you don't mind reading some out. Yeah. Uh, creating decorative pieces whilst, while saving materials from landfill. Ooh, very interesting. Yeah. Okay. Oh, here we go. Uh, master craftsman with 30 years experience in upholstery. A modern take on traditional craft weaving using recycled materials. Eco-friendly graphic design that incorporates, oh, I come in, sorry. incorporates illustration, high quality, handcrafted con contemporary take on heritage crafts. Scent free, cold press soap, uh, locally made, paraben free. Practical, affordable, and eco-friendly products. Ritualistic objects and mindfulness with fabrics. Quality of manufacture, design, competency, com competency, professional, wealth of experience. Experience in and perspective of youth engagement. Fantastic. That's so many interesting different businesses. I'm sure I'll have to look you all up afterwards as well. <laughs> That's really fantastic. And I feel like you all know your businesses really well as well. So hopefully that'll just have confirmed that and you've got some notes on it there as well. Yes. Good. So I mentioned the logo at the very start and that branding isn't just about the logo, but it does include the logo. It definitely does. So um, different ways of looking at the logo or approaching designing it is that you can create your own logo or you can source a designer. And there's no harm in sourcing a designer if creativity is not your thing. And one great community to look at actually is women folk. There's a lot of designers in the women folk community itself. Um, Instagram is a great place to look for people's work as well. But there's also lots of great portfolio sites like Behance and Dribble, um, lots of places to locate and um, commission designers. But what I'm going to be talking a bit more about is doing things yourself. And I'll just go on to the next slide here. So this just shows you a few different things about a logo that you might need to know. So logos come in many different formats and you've probably seen lots of different logos everywhere. We're surrounded by brands all the time. Um, a logo type, something like the Coca-Cola logo over there, where you can see there's a word that's been turned into a logo. So that would be your typical sort of logo type. Um, there's logo marks, so the Apple brand or ones that are relying on symbols or imagery. 
could be looking at logo marks. And then you'll find ones that use a combination of the two. Um, and I think what's quite useful is having that combination of the two. And the reason for that is that you can use them both separately and then together as a combination as well. So it's worth thinking about what your logo might look like, whether you want it to be just a type, a mark or a combination of the two. And it seems very basic and straightforward, but it's just to think about um, the very specific elements of your brand as well. But then what makes a good logo? Because obviously some of that is opinion and aesthetics, but some of the practical elements of it are things like scalability, um, i.e. can you still clearly see it when it's really tiny? Um, an example of that is perhaps whenever you're looking at app design and you're creating a logo, can you still see it when it's on a smartphone? Um, the ability for a logo to work well in both black and white and color so for example, you've created this beautiful logo and brand, you sent it off to somebody, but they just have a black and white printer. Does your logo still look good in black and white? Then adaptability across different formats. So can it work across mobile, web and print? And this might apply to things like perhaps a moving logo. So if you're creating something that has motion in it as well, you should maybe make sure it also has a still image that looks good in print as well. So it's just having to think about some of these very practical, basic things, but they really make the difference when it comes to picking a good logo. So this slide's all about visuals and really to complement your brand, it's great to have good visuals. So things like photography, illustration, video, animation, infographics, quotes and icons, and many more things as well. Um, and here you can see a florist and how they could maybe use different types of visuals to showcase their work. So it could be something like photography. It could be perhaps videos, maybe showing some DIY elements because people love to learn. So that could be one way of showcasing your brand. And it could be things like infographics or some symbols as well or icons. So there's lots of different ways you can show the same thing. If you're finding it difficult to think about what visuals to show for your brand, and it can be quite challenging if you're faced with a blank Instagram feed, for example, and you know what do you actually show? Um, some points to consider are things like behind the scenes or the process of making. Um, maybe some high quality product or service visual shots. Um, and this is particularly important if you're making a physical product to have some really good quality product shots as well. And actually showing some 360 views um, can also be really lovely to show what the product actually looks like. If it's something especially that people can't feel and touch in person, I think that's great to see that. Um, and then also a call to action as well. So are you putting on an exhibition? Are you doing some sort of sale? Do you want people to attend an event or workshop? Um, so a call to action could be a really good way of coming up with a visual as well. So this is an example of how a ceramicist might take all of these points through. Um, so that here they're looking at um, behind the scenes, how they're making, how they're crafting. And there are simple things, just simple videos of, or simple stills of them doing this, but they are high quality and good imagery and visuals as well. And this is off the product as well. So again, one is just off still product shot and the other one is how that product could be potentially used. And by showing these, you can show the customer how they might have that in their homes. Um, so for example, how they could use those vessels um, for maybe a fancy dinner. Obviously we can't have that at the moment, but it might be something to aspire to in the future. And then also things like this. So one of them is just a poster. So the one on the left um, is again, a call to action, getting people to come to this event. They're using a mixture of graphic design and photography. Um, and then also things like Instagram stories. You can also use that and a call to action. And you have these ready-made templates, but it could be using things like custom text or using things like custom visuals to make that personal to your brand as well. So your visuals, well, you can make them original and you can make them yourself. And that's the best thing for all of this. If you can make them yourself, please do. You can as well commission people to do things. So if there's um, some really important photography shots, you could get a photographer to do that. There's a lot of images available on the internet that are free for commercial use. So it's really important to check whether you're able to use them. And there's also a Creative Commons license available for many images as well. Um, and that might let you use it with certain restrictions. For example, you might have to mention the author or the maker of that imagery or visual as well. 
So what we're going to do next is spend about five minutes creating a visual bank. Um, and you can find all these images maybe online or maybe things that you've already collected or things that you want to sketch out. So I'm not sure what devices you're working with at the moment. So whatever you have handy. And we're just going to spend about five minutes just collecting lots of visuals that might inform your brand. So at this point, you don't need to necessarily make something from scratch, but it's maybe collecting things that relate to your brand in some sort of way. And you might find that some of the visuals relate more to your brand than others. So, for example, it might be that your brand is entirely looking at photography and video, and that's totally fine as well. You don't have to use all of these things, but it's just some starting points as to how you could collect visuals for your brand. I have a question, Krishna. Okay. The, if, oh, we have a question here. Sorry, hold on. Uh, any... Are there any readily available templates that you would recommend, please, especially to use on social media? Uh, yes. So if you're looking for social media templates, Canva is the place to go. Um, I think it's got quite a lot of basic templates, but you can also adapt them and make them your own as well. I know a lot of designers are anti-Canva because in a way, Canva takes away some of the bespokeness of a designer creating something. But I think like all other free software, you can combine it with your knowledge of design and turn it into something really special. So I would say Canva is a good place to start with that. So some of these steps might seem like they're quite basic and straightforward, and they are. And the reason for this whole presentation is to give you a structure, because sometimes I feel like you know some of these things already, but whenever somebody says, okay, these are the points that you need to go through, it helps to just get them together and, and create something then from that. It just helps having that outline. So that's three minutes up. Hopefully you've got some nice visuals together. Um, I won't actually ask you to share these because it might be a bit more difficult. Um, so I'll just ask you to hold on to them until a little bit later as well. So you've probably come across a lot of different image formats and all the designers here probably already know all of these. Um, but just in case you're not a designer, but you want to know a little bit about them, I won't go into too much detail and I won't bore you. Uh, but some common image types are a GIF image, which can include motion and transparency. Mm -hmm. The PNG, which is now quite commonly used across websites um, and digital imagery as well. Um, JPEG image, images are quite useful as well, but the only thing about JPEG images is that you can't save them as transparent images. So PNGs can be quite useful if, if, for example, you want the logo, but with no background behind it, a PNG would be the one to go to. Um, a TIFF image is useful if you're looking at printing and especially with things like textiles and fashion, something that requires really high quality printed files. Um, and a PDF, of course, we've all used before, and it's very useful in transporting um, documents across lots of different types of computers and devices as well. So these are just some of the common image types you might come across. So color, color is incredibly important in all aspects of design, including branding. And some of the things that might inform what type of colors you pick are whether you're going for a brand that's quite formal or informal, so do you want things that are quite colourful and bright or do you want things that are a bit more muted? Um, something like three to five key colours are ideal if you're coming up with a colour palette. But the important thing I think at the moment is looking at how suitable your colours are for your end user and whether they're really accessible. And what I find is that there's a really useful tool called Adobe Colour. And some of you might have used this before, but in case you haven't, um, what it does is it lets you pull in imagery like photographs or even a color palette you have drawn out. If you photograph it, you can pull it in and it extracts a digital color palette from that. And that can be in RGB format or CMYK, which is a print format. Um, and it can pull out all of the key colors from your images. So the main ones that feature in it. So this is an example where it's pulled it out of this um, plant image in the center. But what's really good about this tool is that it tells you whether your colors are colorblind safe um, and you can see here it says there's no conflicts found, swatches are colorblind safe, and that means that you can use them across everything and it's very accessible. Because if you are colorblind, you will see these colors in an entirely different way. So these just show you a few examples of how you might see the same colors in the previous palette.
And if there's two colors that are really similar, it can be very difficult to distinguish them. So this is particularly important if you're doing something like a brand or logo, or if you're doing something like a user interface, it's really important to have really distinct colors and colors apart as well. So this is one in which the colors have actually ended up being quite similar. So again, a color has, or a set of colors have been pulled out of this photograph. But here it says A and B are in conflict. So you have to move around one of the colors in order to make them safe to use as well. So you can see here A and B, they're ending up looking quite similar, unfortunately, for those that are colorblind. But then by just changing A a little bit, it means that there's no conflicts found and the swatches are colorblind safe. So it's very easy to make something quite accessible. And you may think, okay, this is very niche, not many people are colorblind, but actually there's a huge proportion of the population that might see this in a completely different way because there are quite a few people that would have slightly different um, observation of the same colors as well. So what I thought we could do is actually create our own color palettes. Um, so if you are able to access a device, if you want to pop onto color.adobe.com, so that's C-O-L-O-R, the American version, uh, .adobe.com. And maybe if we only spend about three minutes on that as well um, and creating a color palette. So the way to do that is to head to extract color. So you'll find over there, uh, sorry, extract theme. Um, if you pull in your image into the center of your screen, it'll be able to extract the theme. You don't have to actually sign up to use this. It's all free to use, but you can sign and save um, all the images as well, but it is all free to use. That is color.adobe.com. Um, does anyone have any questions at this point or is everyone okay at the moment? Uh, I have a question. Okay. So what kind of colors, like do colors have a certain type of feeling attached to them? And does that tie in with it being accessible to people? That's a very good point. Um, so it, they can have many different meanings. So I suppose with colors, if you're going for, for example, bright colors, if you're trying to design things for children, for example, you might want to go for things that are a bit more playful, a bit more colorful. Um, if you're going for a more corporate brand identity, it might be something that is a bit more subtle or muted as well. Um, but in terms of accessibility, in this case, it's very practical. So very practically, you might actually just see the colors entirely differently. So this is just about making them a bit more distinguishable from other colors as well. Um, and I think, you know, when it comes to branding, it's important to have fun with it as well. So you don't want to end up having your brand just look like all the other ones out there. If they're brands that are minimalist and everyone's doing the same thing, it all ends up looking the same. But it's just seeing what's appropriate for your audience, really. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that answers that at all. Hopefully it does. Yeah, so it's <laughs> knowing what brand colors that you want, but it's also making sure it's in line with who your target audience is. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. So you might find that, you know, say I'm creating a really colorful, playful brand for kids and I find an image that really suits it color wise and I pull it into Adobe Color. Um, what this point lets you do is just make sure that it's also accessible to colorblind kids, for example. Mm -hmm. So it's just taking two steps. The first one is actually looking at who you're designing this whole brand for or who your end user is and coming up with your color palette. But the second step is just making sure it's accessible then to as many users within that target audience as well. Yeah. Uh, someone has put a link in the chat box of oh. a good book. Uh, on information on color psychology. Perfect, thank you very much. And again, this is just to get you used to doing all of these things. So you might find afterwards that actually, you know, my color palette's entirely different and that's totally fine as well. But it's just getting you used to trying out these different ways of working and coming up with your brand idea. So let's move on to the next one. So fonts and typography. So again, these will be really key within your brand. And there's many different places you can actually find fonts as well online. So some of the free spaces you can find fonts in are DaFont and Font Squirrel. They've both got crazy names, but they have a lot of free fonts on there as well. Um, Adobe Fonts is great because you can just import it into the Adobe software if you're using that, for example, InDesign or Illustrator. 
Google fonts are really good as well, and they're really good for web particularly as well. Um, and you work for them. It's a really interesting one, which has more bespoke and interesting fonts. So if you want something that's quite different to anything else that's out there, then you work for them might be good. But um, that one's a bit more expensive. So you usually have to pay for a license to use the font as well. And again, what makes a good font? Well, it really depends on what you're using it for and that it's appropriate to its end use. So again, if you're making something that is for um, an older audience, it might be something that's very clear and easy to read. Um, if it's something that's meant to be quite humorous, then maybe it is something that has some playful elements to it as well. So it's just making sure it's appropriate for the end user. But some things that are common to everything is maybe looking at a few different types of font for your brand. So you might not just want to go for one thing. You might be looking at fonts that cover things like titles within where you're using that in your branding messaging, for example. You might be looking at a body font as well. And maybe one for social as well. So it's maybe coming up with a range of fonts that all suit each other that you can use in different ways. And it's also looking at whether you want to use serif or sans serif fonts. And at the moment, there's a nice trend of combining the two as well. So maybe having a header in the serif font and then all of the main text in sans serif, for example. For example. Um, so you can see actually with the serif font there, if you don't know what serif or sans serif is, serif is just the one with the little curly edges. So anything that has a little bit of a decorative element on the edge is a serif font. Sans serif is a bit cleaner and sharper and more minimal. Um, also looking at font size and color. So font size can be incredibly important, as I mentioned, for older people or people that have some sort of visual impairment. Um, it's really important to have a really clear and big font size. Um, and color can be important. So if you have a lot of light grays on a white background or something that's very um, close in terms of contrast, it's very difficult to see it. And it might mean that, you know, it looks very beautiful or elegant, but actually no one can actually read your message. So it's making sure that it's actually easy to read as well. It's, it's important for it to be very accessible. And then the scalability of the font as well. Can you still read it when it's really tiny? So can you read it whenever it's on a smartphone as well as whenever you're seeing it on your laptop as well, for example? So the next step in this uh, presentation is looking at language. So whether you're company or your brand is coming up with more formal or informal language. Um, if you look at innocent drinks, they're very humorous with everything they use. So again, in their social media speak, it's all about it being quite funny. Um, they keep on going on about how their new brand is um, or their new drink is blue, um, which I don't know if it's funny or not, but it's got that real quirkiness that you know is associated with innocent drink and you know it's by them. So they have a certain feel and language that they use all the time. Um, it's whether you're um, talking about yourself. So if you're an artist, or if you're doing something that's very much about you, um, maybe you're talking about it from your perspective, but if it's from a company's perspective, so is the point of your brand that it's actually a studio? Are you aiming for it to be something that's a bit more scalable? Then perhaps you're talking about it in that way as well, that you're talking about our studio, you're saying we instead of I all the time. Um, also looking at simple and understandable ways of speaking, which can be useful across everything as well. Um, simple always wins because no matter what you're designing for, it's always important for it to be really clear. It's never going to be wrong for it to be clear. So I think that that's really key across all language, whether it's going to be formal, informal, technical or not, simple and accessible always wins. <laughs> The next thing is channels. So you can see there are there's lots and lots of social media channels that you could potentially use to put your brand across. Um, and I think we're all guilty of using the same four, probably Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, or something, some combination of those. But actually there's many others that you could also utilize for your brand. And it might be that something like Skype might be the most appropriate channel for putting out your brand. Um, it could be if you're doing a lot of voice-based branding or a lot of voice-based discussion within your brand. So workshops or one-on-one -on -one consultations, maybe Skype is the way forward for you. If you're looking at maybe getting commissions or clients um, for design, then maybe looking at Behance or Dribble or one of the portfolio-based sites might be perfect for you. Um, if you're looking at written or writing-based things, maybe Medium might work well for you. 
or with craft products, maybe Etsy might work better for you. So it's just picking maybe a few of these channels instead of um, going to the same old, same places like Twitter. Twitter might not be appropriate for your brand, uh, but something like um, Behance might really help your brand take off. So it's picking the right channels that really suit your brand. So then we're just going to take a couple of minutes just to decide which three channels would suit your brand best. And they can be any channels. It could even be TikTok if that's appropriate to your brand. But it's just maybe looking at three social channels or platforms that suit your brand best. So I know for us um, with Belfast Design Week and what we've been doing with it, actually recently LinkedIn has been a really good point of contact for us. And that area has grown quite a lot in terms of a social channel. And it's meant that actually um, people, international people, people from Chicago, for example, have been in touch with us about projects because of the LinkedIn side of things, which we'd never really considered until the, the last couple of years. So it's interesting to figure out which um, channels have been really useful for you and which ones you should focus on promoting through as well. Yeah, because it can be quite confusing to know, like you would assume that everything should just be on Instagram, but like you're saying, like it might not be suitable at all and you're wasting all this energy on one platform that doesn't give you the return. Yeah, absolutely. And some people go onto some platforms just to see things, um, but it's maybe to see where your customers are. So people that maybe support you might not necessarily be the same as the people that are actually your end users as well. So it's just figuring that out and where they might live really online. And I just noticed there as well, Kickstarter, that might be a really good channel for you. So if you're coming up with a new product idea and want to launch it, then that's actually a really good way of showcasing it internationally as well. So I think that's another one to consider. So then within those three channels that you might have picked, within that, you might actually even just focus on one. Um, so I just want to give an example of um, a company that has used storytelling really well through one of their channels, which is Instagram, actually, um, which I think we're all probably on if we're creative entrepreneurs. We're definitely on Instagram. So during lockdown, there were certain accounts that I kept going back to and looking at. And this was definitely one of them. Um, it's a street food company that's based in the UK called Mobley. And it does Indian street food. So it was up my street as well because I, I love anything to do with food. I'm always there. Um, so this was the owner, Nisha Katona. And throughout the pandemic, she posted lots and lots of imagery, lots of stuff about the brand. But she just did it in a really engaging way. So I just thought I'd share some of the things that she did. So she has these pets. They became a core part of her Instagram story. The brand was very much about her because she was always showing things behind the scenes from her home, her pets, her family. So definitely became all about her and how she was doing that as well. But people really loved that because they wanted to see that. They wanted to see who this person was behind this brand. And because it was street food, it was meant to be very accessible and down to earth. And I think that just really tied very well together as well. So this is again a video of her cooking in her house. So she did lots of these little videos and they were free. Obviously, they're on Instagram. People could just see them. Um, and they were educational because you could learn how to make curry or dumplings or anything wow. else um, within that as well. Um, and I just thought it was really great because actually... Um, you know, you don't always have to make content to sell. It can be content to upsell. So this is something that could be quite useful, showing something that is useful to people, an educational video or an educational infographic. But then people remember your brand and go back to maybe eat at your restaurant or maybe buy your book or do something down the line as well. So it's another element of the brand that can be quite nicely done and quite easy to do as well, potentially. And then another thing I quite liked about Mowgli was that they tied in with their customers and created a, a Christmas card campaign um, where they raised money for a lot of charities as well. But they got their customers involved in helping them design these cards as well. So a lot of user buy-in from their customers. Um, and it all tied back to the brand because it had the monkey from their branding. It had the pets. Um, it had Mowgli there. So it was a really nice way of bringing it back to the customers as well. So I thought that was really lovely as well. So that's just an example of something that had gone well online. Um, and then just some common good advice for all brands, really. Um, obviously, everyone's brands are going to be very different. There's furniture makers here, soap makers, there'll be designers, graphic designers, UX designers. Um, but what's very useful is having clear visuals. 
And a really useful thing is avoiding typos. And that's easier for some than others. And so I would recommend maybe using some sort of software like Grammarly, for example, um, that helps you just edit down and have better grammar and uh, less errors as well. Because the main reason for that is not because I'm a nitpicker, maybe I am a little bit of a nitpicker, but actually um, whenever you see a website and you see a lot of misspelled things or things that don't look quite right, you don't trust it. And the same way, if there's a brand that's trying to sell you there's somebody, <laughs> bless you, <laughs> there's somebody there that is um, trying to get you to buy something, but everything is misspelled or doesn't quite look right, then you might not trust that brand as easily. So it's just building trust by making sure it's as professional as possible. And not everybody is good at spelling and that's completely understandable. So maybe to use some sort of software or asking somebody to help you as well. And then other common good advice is making sure that your imagery is as original as possible. So wherever possible, if you're able to take your own photos or commission somebody to do that, that's perfect and ideal. Um, and wherever you can't, if you make sure you try and acknowledge the creator of whatever you're using as well. It's important to try and be as sustainable as possible and sustainability in terms of, yes, less wastage, but also in terms of is this sustainable? Is this something I can do long term? So if you're not able to do an Instagram post every single night, that's totally fine. So it's just figuring out what is sustainable for you as a business as well. It's looking at the ethics behind things. So making sure that what you're sharing is true and fair and authentic. And I think a lot of you said at the start as well that authenticity is at the core of your brand values as well. So just bringing it all the way back to that. And then also accessible. If you can make any element of your business accessible, you definitely should because there's nothing you know, stopping you from doing that. So I think accessible can only be good and something to be encouraged as well. And simple things can make a big difference. So this um, example is Spotify whenever it started out versus Spotify now and the logo. And you can see it's using a lot of the um, same sort of elements. It's got those three lines for sound. Um, it's got um, the same sort of lettering and things, but actually it's changed its font. It's changed the color. It's made it a bit more vibrant as well. And it's just changed it completely. It's made it really, really modern. So these small changes can really uplift and make your brand much more visually striking as well. So these are just some free tools that you can potentially use. Um, I'd mentioned Canva before. So we're talking about social media images. Canva is perfect. You can go in there and use that. And Canva actually is really useful for creating your own brand guidelines. So with all the things you've been noting down, you can actually put them into brand guidelines within Canva as well. Then the Nine Project is brilliant for icons and symbols. GIMP Shop is an alternative to Photoshop, which you can use as well. So for doing any sort of mock-ups or looking at your logo, for example. Um, and Inkscape is the same as well. It's an alternative to Illustrator, so it's quite useful as well. And Unsplash is brilliant for royalty-free photography. Um, and you can also acknowledge the photographer wherever possible. Um, but it's a really, really great site with a lot of really high-res imagery as well, so it's very useful. Then Trello and Miro are perfect if you're coming up with ideas for your brand. So again, it's just a sort of whiteboard tool where you can put up lots of different things. But it's also very good for user journeys or getting to know um, your user a bit better or your customer because um, it lets you put up empathy boards. It lets you look at the customer journey as well. So those two tools are quite useful. And then Dropbox and WeTransfer are also brilliant for sharing files. So Dropbox could be really useful, for example, if you want to store all of these things, the visual elements, the fonts, et cetera, in a folder, Dropbox is free and easy to use as well. And I'm not uh, being paid by Dropbox or anything. These are just all tools that I use myself as well. So then just to end, this is a DIY guideline checklist. And these are not all of the things that you require for a brand, but they are all of the main things that you need whenever you're creating a brand for yourself. So it's coming up with your brand values that will be at the core of everything that you do. It'll be coming up with some sort of logo, whether that's type or a mark or a combination of the two. It's looking at colors, how you can make them really accessible to as many users as possible but also relevant to who you're creating your product or service for. 
Looking at fonts and typography and how you can maybe create something a little more bespoke by maybe using some of those sites I mentioned as well. Maybe looking at language to see how you're portraying your brand online through words, through audio, um, and how you're doing that, whether it's informal or formal, what sort of language. Looking at visuals like photography, illustration, video, animation, etc., And then also the channels by which you're reaching people. So what sort of social media channels, websites, print, et cetera, digital, physical, immersive. And just to end as well, um, it takes a lot of practice to get this right. And the more you do it, the more you'll find it easy to do. And it's very difficult if you've never done anything for your brand before, just starting all the way from scratch. Um, so hopefully these are some good pointers that take you in the right direction. Um, and the more you do, the easier it'll get, but also your brand will keep evolving. So this isn't the end of it. It's always an alive, it's a breathing, living thing. So you can keep adding to it and changing it as you go on and as your brand evolves as well. So hopefully that's been useful. I think I've talked a bit longer than I actually thought I was going to, but um, that's me for now. So thank you very much. Brilliant. So I have a question for you and Christine uh, about Belfast Design Week, just real quick. Um, I just wondered if you guys could maybe talk about like what the journey has been like building Belfast Design Week and how important the brand has played into that. Sure, yeah. Um, do you want to go first, Christine, this time? Uh, <laughs> you, can, you can start, Krishma, and then I'll, okay. I'll fill in the bits you've missed out. You're warmed up. Right. Yeah, okay, okay, yeah. I have been talking for a long time. Um, well, we started Belfast Design Week all the way back in 2015. And it, it's interesting because it's a design festival. So again, it's a different type of thing to brand for. And what we've tried to do is keep the logo consistent over the years, but keep the theme different each year. Um, and the way to do that is to maybe come up with a proper theme that covers a lot of areas. So we cover everything from UX design to fashion and illustration. So it has to be a theme that matches all of those things. So over the year, we've over the years we've had things like environment and heritage, for example. So it's coming up with brands around those themes per year, but keeping our main logo consistent throughout as well. And we've been working with lots of different creatives, mainly Ronan from Two Digs as well throughout. Um, he's a graphic designer. He's really brilliant typographer as well, um, but also illustrators as well and um, other graphic designers, myself as well. So, yeah, collaboration, I think, as well. What do you think, Christine? Yeah, I think you're right, Krishma. I think it's a, it's a hard one in a way to brand a festival like that because we're trying to one of our core values, I think, as a festival is to create something that is inclusive and accessible. And we do work with such a broad range of people. We do stuff for families and kids. We do a lot of corporate work. They're kind of probably our main customers and that they're the ones that sponsor the event. So we have to do something that's for them, but it also works with, I guess, a lot of the young creatives that come to the events. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so I think it's an interesting one to do. And I think, Krishma, you're right. We try to keep the the logo the same um but then be a bit more playful with some of the background kind of imagery and I think on social media it's very different work with a brand like that because we have to make sure that everybody that's involved with the festival is represented so it's maybe not as curated as some businesses can be because it's very important to us like what's one of our values I suppose to be inclusive and let everybody that's a part of the festival have the same same platform on social media so I think some design things, if they're for a very specific designer audience, can be quite sort of curated, I suppose, of what they put out there. Whereas ours is a wee bit more playful and a wee bit more hopefully representative of all the different types of people that are involved in the festival. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Anything else that we've left out, Esther, do you think? Um, no, I think we've covered everything. Um, I just want to open it up to the floor or the room or whatever this is called. <laughs> If anyone has any questions, the virtual room. <laughs> uh, yeah, if anyone has any questions about what we've covered today or any troubleshooting things or personal experiences on branding. Oh, yeah. And whoever mentioned their business card, if they have it there, we could have a look at it as well, if you want us to. That is. Can I just say one other thing, actually, just thinking about that we haven't really touched on is I think we have mentioned it, Christian mentioned it in the slides, but I know with Design Week, we were talking a lot about the logo and the visuals. 
But I think so much more of it is about how you communicate with all the different people that are involved with your business. So whether it's having a, how you pick up the phone, how you reply to emails, how quickly you reply to emails, inquiries, messages. So I think, don't forget that word of mouth, particularly in a community like Northern Ireland, is probably still the most important way of communicating your business. So don't leave that wee bit out there as well. So good customer service and all those yeah. more boring, not as exciting as Instagram stories, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's not as exciting, but it's really important, I think, because, you know, everyone hates that brand that like never replies to them or the company that, you know, mm. is rude or doesn't know how to respond to their um, users as well. Yeah. And I think especially for Design Week, it's the same about being inclusive. We want to make sure that we reply to everybody, even if they're not the super cool, exciting inquiries. But yeah. <laughs> So we have one question here. How many fonts would you recommend to use? I think you mentioned it earlier. Yeah. So um, basically, as as many fonts as you need, depending on what sort of project you're working on, which is a very um, loose answer. But I would say maybe having something like two to three is perfect. So you might have maybe a title font, a body font, and then having one for socials, for example. So just having things, it's mainly about consistency, really, so that whenever people see your brand, um, it's not using lots of different things each time. Um, so, for example, if you're going onto Instagram stories, not to mention that again, <laughs> stories, um, but if you're using the same font throughout, then people start to recognize that. So whenever they see it, they know it's your brand. They match all that up together. So it's just about creating that uniformity, really. And I would say maybe two to three, band oh, two to three fonts is perfect whenever you're starting out. I can't talk after I've been talking for an hour. I think my, my mouth is running out of words. <laughs> um, I have a question. Do is there like trendy brand fonts at the minute and does that exist through different kind of eras? Oh, good point. So um, I would say if you go to you work for them, it's very good at spotting all the, the like recent trends and branding. Um, and I think something that is, you know, quite um, minimal is quite trendy always just because it, it tends to be a bit more accessible because if you've got too many things going on sometimes the readability goes down as well um, but I think you work for them as a really good starting place to go and see what people are doing what the different um, font houses are doing as well so I think that's, that's a good place to start. Mm -hmm. We have another question uh, did you say that Nine Project was a logo generator are there any others Trying to do a bit of brainstorming here and we'd love to see if they came up with anything new. Ah, okay, good point. Um, so the Nine Project is full of symbols, actually. So you can use them as logos. So what you can do is actually you can purchase each of the symbols individually. Um, because what happens is if you're using the free version, you have to credit the user. But you can purchase it. And it's very cheap, actually. I think it's like three pounds or something like that. Um, and then you can use it for um, anything you need to use it for. Um, I think perhaps, you know, other logo generators as well. Um, I would say there are things like Pixabay, for example, so that would have a lot of illustration on it too. Um, what I would say is maybe using that as inspiration, but coming up with something of your own can be better in a way because it'll be a bit more original and different as well. But I think the Noun project is really good in terms of a starting point for logos as well. And then we have another question here. Is there an easy way to share Adobe font with a client to use themselves? What I would say is that they would probably need to have Adobe <laughs> software to be able to open it because um, it opens up in the Adobe programs like InDesign and Illustrator, etc. But I would say if there's something from Da Font or one of those where you can just download the font, I think that might be a better way if the client doesn't have that software to maybe use something where you can actually just send the files themselves over. Mm -hmm. Because for Adobe, they've had that buy-in with all their programs as well. So there's a slightly different. And then there's another question. Is it a good idea to provide a mood board for a graphic designer to design a logo? 100%. I think the more information you can give a graphic designer, the better as well. And I think, Christine, you might have some points with this as well, because I know you've also worked with lots of different graphic designers over the years. Nothing dodgy as well, by the way. <laughs> yeah, I just think the more info you can get. And I also think like this is a DIY workshop and a lot of stuff you can do yourself. But I do think investing in someone to do your logo. If you can get somebody, like there's a lot of really good people in the women folk that are probably not hugely expensive because they're maybe getting started in their career. Um, and they're also quite supportive. So they'll give you the tools that you need to take it forward. So you're not kind of going back 
because what gets expensive is if you're paying for lots of bits and pieces down the line sometimes that investment of getting the logo and the guidelines that you can then carry it on yourself if you have a good creative eye is worth doing but yeah the more info you can give them quicker it is for, is for them to do it so the cheaper it is for you as well because you'll be able to get something that you like first time definitely when, and I think it's also good to actually show some things that you don't like as well. So it's important having your like mood board and then also just a few examples of things you definitely don't want, just so they know what you definitely don't want as well. I think that can be quite useful. I think we should maybe wrap up if no one has any questions. Um, but yeah, thank you so much everyone for joining. Uh, this is our first Zoom event, so I think I think we did pretty well <laughs> with a few, few glitches. Um, and yeah, it's exciting. We're going to be doing another event next week. Um, and then we also have a couple of ones in March as well. So there's going to be setting up a website for how to photograph your products. And then the big one is social media tips for Instagram and how to create content. So just keep in touch uh, with our socials and you'll get more information. And also, yeah, if you guys wouldn't mind filling out the feedback form that we'll send tomorrow morning, just so we can get a feel for how everything's going and so we can put more on. Um, but yeah, it's been great and it's been really enjoyable. And thank you so much for Krishma for uh, taking the workshop and being super informative. And yeah, thank you so much for taking the time to come out. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Bye, everybody. Thanks. Bye. See you soon. Thanks a lot.